This is the Life Journey Podcast with Quentin, a.k.a. Q Gauze No Days Off. From on the field and off the field, NFL player and entrepreneur. Motivating you to be the best you can be and getting you out of your comfort zone. Sharing with you travel, sports, and entrepreneurial tips with amazing guests on the show. Now, get ready for your life to change with the Life Journey Podcast and your host, Quentin Gauze. What's up, everybody, and what's going on? Welcome to the Life Journey Podcast. This is season three. We're in season three of the Life Journey Podcast, and we have um, always have some great listeners on. Um, thank you guys for tuning in for this video. Uh, so in this video today, we have Bezrat Gabra Michael, and she is uh, she works at Google, and uh, you, can, you can kind of talk about yourself. You went to Georgetown, and very successful young lady, like uh, through, through ranking up and like a lot of uh, accomplishments. So yeah, definitely talk about like your childhood growing up and um, yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so when I was growing up, um, so we take me way back. Uh, so I was born in Philly, um, moved all around the United States. Um, I, a lot of people ask if I was part of a military family, but no, that wasn't the case. My parents just wanted to find a better place to educate their children. And so grew up in, or was born in Philly, stayed there for a couple of years. There were a lot of gangs that were coming into the area. So my dad didn't want us to live around all of that as we were growing up. And so he just decided to move all of us over to Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, we were there for a couple of years as well. And that's where my brother was born. Uh, my sister was born in Philly. Um, but once we were all there, what we started realizing was that the humidity started affecting my brother's um, asthma. And so my parents also realized that they had to leave in order to make sure that he could breathe. And so uh, we moved over to Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And once we got there, we also stayed there for a couple of years and soon realized that that place was at least the area that we were living in was relatively racist. And my parents also realized that they didn't want us to live in that area either. And so finally we moved over to Las Vegas, Nevada, and that's where we've been for 10 plus years or so. And that is, you know, where I spent most of my development as a, as a young kid, uh, stayed there until I was around uh, 17, 18. And then I moved over to Washington DC for uh, school at Georgetown University. Um, stayed there for four years and moved over to the Bay Area and now kind of moving over to a new place altogether. So, you know, living across all these different places, it was it was a great way of just learning how to coexist within different communities. So I know how to talk to basically about anyone. But I think at the same time, it was very difficult as a young kid and just knowing how to develop and strengthen relationships, considering mm. I knew that these people were in my life for a certain moment or I kind of developed the habit of learning that they were in a certain they were here for a certain moment and then um, and then I would be leaving or, or they would be leaving or whatever so it kind of led to different <laughs> commitment issues I guess um, but at the same time it also did develop this habit of getting bored of routine which I still have until this very day and it's something that I actually take a lot of pride in and in, in wanting to learn and create and continue doing um, new cool things um, and continue to move and, and challenge myself in different ways as well. So that was that was essentially most of my upbringing. That's pretty cool um, to hear that because you went, went from different states. You said you went from like Philly, like Philly has some hood areas and you and you went to Indianapolis where it is racist and then uh, Las Vegas and then DC. So you've been around, you had a chance to be around a lot of different people, like you said, and be able to maneuver within talking to different races, talking to different people and know how to like, uh, I guess like imitate or, you know, be, you know, connect, I guess. The right. The word. So that's pretty right. cool. Like, Cause I'm, yeah, same way, like hood to suburbs, being, yeah, can just like, however way to connect with people um, naturally. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a pretty, that's an awesome, that's a, that's a skill. I think that's a skill to have. A lot of people don't have that, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think that, you know, within these communities also, one of the things that I take a lot of pride in is that um, like there, I mean, there were a lot of people that looked 
relatively similar to me, if not, we were all kind of within the same socioeconomic class, right? So we're all like relatively like low income. There were uh, there were a few people that, you know, once I started getting into high school, were a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say even like upper middle class, but I'd say maybe around like lower middle class. And, and so it was, it wasn't that hard in connecting with them because we all shared similar struggles for the most part. I didn't realize or really could define what those struggles were as a kid. I mean, I can, I can now see it and understand it as I connect the dots, but the, the thing is, you know, we had that shared identity. And then once I went to Georgetown university, that was a, it, it was a, it was a wildly different experience because it was a whole lot of, you know, white people and then a lot of really wealthy people. And so that was a very, that was a very new experience for me. And I, I hadn't lived in, you know, predominantly white or rich spaces ever growing up. Um, so a lot of, I mean, when I got to Georgetown also, it was a lot of insecurities that I hadn't realized I had developed when I was a younger kid. And, um, and it was multiplied once I got there because I definitely stood out like a sore thumb. So things around, you know, the, like wealth, right? So the wealth gap was incredibly different. Um, it was a lot of people whose parents were, you know, famous designers or, you know, uh, princes of Jordan or, or things like that. And so there, there were a lot of incredibly wealthy people. And I realized for the uh, probably the first time that I came from like a lower income st uh, status when, you know, there were students who were looking to get into uh, ski trips and they were looking to, you know, get food every single day. And it's just like these small things that I realized I just didn't have the money for. And these students, you know, had the opportunity to have through uh, maybe, you know, their own work or potentially like their own, their own parents and such. So that was a very big thing. The other thing was just around, uh, you know, beauty standards and appearance considering I was a dark skinned black woman and in this sea of you know predominantly white people and so there was a lot of you know insecurities around you know should I continue straightening my hair should I continue uh wearing like the clothes that I wore growing up like should I start assimilating and like blending into this community and uh there were a lot of challenges that were kind of faced especially in my first two years at Georgetown. Uh, so, so you know how they say um, specific schools like uh, was a PO, was a POW? No, no, yeah. uh, PWIs, yeah, predominantly yeah, yeah, yeah. white. So students. that's, what, that's yeah. what Georgetown was, yeah. So, yeah, one hundred percent. It was so funny, actually. You know, Wale had this. Oh, Wale. Came, <laughs> Wale came to Georgetown once, and he actually thought that it was an HBCU because all of our uh, football players, our basketball players, like all these athletes were predominantly black, you know? So he thought that it was an HBCU. And I still remember that to this day because I just think about the way that we present ourselves yet, you know, we are very much a predominantly white institution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and being in those same type of institutions, like you definitely, but you definitely have an opportunity to, to like rise above and not be, you know, to rise above the status quo for sure. And um, right. Talk about some of those yeah. accomplishments that you had over there. And um, and then also, yeah, some of the, I think some of the accomplishments from high school going into there and then departing from Georgetown as well. Yeah, uh, so for, from high school, you know, I think, I think I take a lot of pride in the fact that I just worked hard and I learned how to work hard. Mm -hmm. My parents very much gave me a, it, it was almost like an ultimatum of like, you're gonna get straight A's or else. I don't, like, you know, like that could mean, that could mean a, uh, a whooping. It could literally mean anything, but they're like, you're gonna get straight A's like no matter what. And so that was the bar that they had set. And so I always just made sure that I hit that bar. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to, uh, or yeah, my senior year of high school, graduated, you know, got valedictorian, got all these really amazing accomplishments, um, was leader, you know, had leadership positions in various organizations uh, from business to pre-med and such. And then went to, uh, went to Georgetown. And, you know, because of, I, th I think one of the things that I really learned probably within like my second year after going through these different, um, you know, insecurities with my different identities is that there were a lot of people 
that were probably two years or so above me that just fully embraced and accepted all of their identities. And that was something that I looked up to, just like seeing them walk around campus and being able to just feel so confident and fully in the skin they're in. And so I took a lot of pride and um, I took a lot of pride in like my, my confidence came from the black women that were two years or so above me. And I, I realized, you know, like if, if they were able to do it and they were able to look so cool doing that, I just want to be able to be a part of like the winning group. And so I just started, I just started getting better about accepting who I was and, you know, realizing that there isn't really anything that I could, that I should change and um, started, you know, focusing more on um, how I can also support other people who are also facing similar struggles. Right. And so with socioeconomic status, I started working with a group of students at Georgetown called the Georgetown Scholarship Program. Uh, so they're, they're first gen and low income as well. And so I started working with them a little bit more, sat on their, um, their leadership, their, their board, their student board. And then I also started helping them with just different you know, initiatives, things that would help with driving community and then also helping them with their social media and like marketing presence as well. And then I, so that was on the class side. And then I also started doing a lot more to also help other black women, uh, the black college women, uh, not just at Georgetown, but across the different areas. And so I essentially started, uh, was so my sophomore year, with two really good friends, I started an event that would focus on socioeconomic status as well as race. That went really well. Uh, my two friends at the time were seniors and I was a sophomore. And then um, with the great excitement around that, I thought, you know, for the next year, what could I, what else could I do? And does it make sense to really just zoom in on a specific population? And so my junior year, I started working on an idea with two other really amazing black women that would essentially create an event that was specifically for other black college women, both at Georgetown and then across other campuses. And so that was called the Brave Summit. And what we did there was celebrate and provide opportunities to these really amazing black women um, across all different backgrounds. So, you know, we looked at the different intersections, like how can we target black women um, with different sexualities, with different, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic statuses, with different uh, immigration statuses, like things like that. And so we put on this event, uh, got a lot of really great reception. I ended up raising, like I think the first year was around 17,000 or so for the event. Um, and then we, uh, we just put on this really amazing bed for like maybe 250 or so black women and then and allies as well and then the next year we held a similar event the same thing and that was my senior year rose the population to 450 plus and then we raised around 20 to 22 thousand or so um in dollars and we got a lot of really great you know donations from different companies like google actually who i was at the time interning that summer i was interning with and so it turned out to be a really great moment for other black women to just see these like really beautiful, powerful, um, like incredible black women from all kinds of industries, you know, from uh, medicine to business to um, therapists to activists, like just all these really amazing black women who've succeeded so much within their own respective careers. Um, kind of just give a shining light to other black women to say that this is also possible for them. and. Uh, the way that they have accepted and celebrated their own beauties are a good, you know, inspiring way for other black women to, to do the same. So that was, that was, those are my two biggest highlights, I would say probably in, um, at Georgetown. So it started off with, you know, me not really embracing my identities whatsoever to really me feeling extremely comfortable in who I was and, I, you know, at the so I started off, you know, I, I think my my first year at Georgetown with very much straight, like straightened hair, uh, you know, just didn't really feel comfortable whatsoever in myself. And then I ended Georgetown, you know, with this big curly hair. I, I rarely straighten it these days. And I, you know, you could see me like walking across campus because my hair is just that visible. And with these like little booties, so I just make a like it's a presence at this point. And I see this, you know, just 
who I am and how I dress and how my hair is as like this form of resistance in a way for, you know, both Georgetown and now I bring this into Google as well. Mm. That's powerful right there. That, from like you said, you're talking about the insecurities early on and fighting through that and understanding who you are and you develop. And that's why I love I love college because it, it gives you that space and time to do that, to understand yeah. yourself and develop. And yeah, you come out the, the other end uh, just you know successful on the other end and feeling good about yourself yeah. and going ready to attack life. And that's amazing that you guys raised that amount, amount of money and be able to do that for and it's for a great cause as well. And yeah. That's what it's all about. That's that's awesome. And like you're, I can see like your your heart. You're definitely. I can see you. You're definitely a person that wants to help people. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's at the core of everything that I want to do. Right. Like my parents growing up always wanted me to become a doctor. Like there's a saying that's like, you know, African parents, you're either a doctor, or a lawyer, or you're a failure. And I 100% agree with that. You know, they wanted to. They wanted me to become a doctor, and I think it was only really a way to push myself to this guaranteed sort of success you know like if I'm going to be a doctor there's a very much defined line in terms of um you know how I can get up to being a successful person and, and for the most part success here just means a financial success and so that was that was what they wanted and um you know by my sophomore year of Georgetown I realized at the core of what I wanted to do was really just help people and so I just started breaking away from pre-med and found other ways that I could help people instead so that's kind of how I moved over to the business side and with that guaranteed success though that was you know at the what I realized um at the time was a was a uh, a byproduct of being a doctor mm -hmm. I realized that I had to find some sort of way to fill that gap and so I just made sure that I was doing everything that I possibly could to get the best career within business that I could get um, you know the best access to various opportunities and that I just couldn't fail <laughs> and so that's how it kind of led over to Google as well and making sure that you know I got the best tech job and and things like that wow. You got to get it planned out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like just seeing where, you know, it, it wasn't really planned out necessarily. It was more just seeing where, you know, if I was going to take this risk, this calculated risk, right, right. Um, just knowing where I can make myself feel better and just filling that gap. So for me, the risk was just realizing that I may not be able to make the same kinds of money as a doctor um, when I was younger. And, um, and just finding a way to fill that gap with a plan. And that's exactly what I did. That's smart. And I love the word calculated risk. Um, yeah. That, yeah, it is a difference between just jumping, like someone just quitting their job and becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah. Or slowly, you know, save up, save up some money. Yeah. Be a bit, you know, start the business while you're working and then right. transition over. So that's, yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. What's your favorite hometown restaurant or family meal? Man, um, hmm. So the first, oh gosh, okay. So now I'm just having all these different <laughs> ideas. Of course. Uh, yeah, it was like the first idea that I had, but I was thinking, no, that was too recent, it was Bay Area. Uh, so I, I think I go back to just um, this one place. Okay, so in terms of a restaurant, I go back to a place in DC called Barcelona Wine Bar. And it was just this, beautiful place where they had tapas um and it was just like all these like really amazing so they had patatas bravas they had um different like really great eggplant dishes and i hate eggplant for the most part but like i would always eat their eggplant dishes and then they had really great wine and it was just a really good vibe and so whenever i go back to dc i always go back to that restaurant just because of the really good memories that i've had there and so, and it, it just, yeah, it was a beautiful setting for beautiful people and beautiful, um, beautiful friends and company. And so, uh, so that was, that was a big thing for DC. When I moved over to the Bay Area, uh, started, it was also another wine bar called Amelie and it was a French wine bar. And they, they had different meals, but I would mostly go there for the different wine as well. And that was, um, it's just a place that I would always frequent like frequently go to at, at some point they just they, they started to know me and they would give me free wine and free food and all of that stuff because I would just go there so often and I'd bring them good business mm. and then um in terms of really good uh so a home 
home cooked meal. I think my favorite is um, this dish called uh, so it's an it's called injada, and so within injada there's something called bursun, um, which is in Tigrinya, and then there's another I think in in um, Haddock, it's called misurwat. And so basically it's like this, um, it's like lentils and you can do it either spiced uh, with um, like a, a spicy like chili pepper, or you could do it a little bit more plainly, um, making it almost like a lentil soup kind of kind of similar um, thing. So I usually eat that and then I, um, I love eating it with like a jalapeno on the side or something, but yeah. I love injera bread, I love injera and like- yeah. Yeah, and they're different, like you can mix it up, right? You have your meats, like it's all spread out on the platter, right? Yeah, you, you could have like different types of food, you know, on it as like as much as you want. I like to, I like to make like certain foods like mixed together. My mom like usually eats it, you know, with, she, she puts on like anything on that plate, <laughs> but I usually just like to find like the good ones that like mix well together. So if I'm gonna have a vegetable, um, for the most part, I want to make sure that all the other foods are vegetables too. I'm going to have a meat that I'm going to have maybe this like cottage cheese, um, kind of thing, like on the side, um, so that it, you know, lessens the spiciness a little bit out, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Food. Yeah. I love food. I'm a foodie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's dive into, uh, okay. You're, you're transitioning over to Google now and you're yeah, you're working you're working at google and yep what was that experience like yeah uh so i was an intern at google first that was my junior year of college and then got the opportunity for full time and when i got into full time my first year wasn't the role that i wanted to be in but i just figured i would just you know find a way to enter the company and then kind of move forward from there and so the first year i was focusing more on it was like, it was almost like answering customer tickets. Uh, so just like whatever issues that they had, um, I would just answer and respond back to, uh, you know, their issues with the different solutions that they could potentially move forward with. And so that was a, it was, it was a very, like it was a routine type based role and I didn't like it at all for the most part. But I think one of the things that I learned while being in it was that if I did really, really well, that it would give me the good recognition and like access for another opportunity moving forward. And so that's exactly what I did. I started answering the most amount of tickets globally. I started getting the highest uh, performance metrics globally as well. And so there were all these things that I just did really well with that core role. And then I would also have these different, what we consider 20% projects, which are ways to you know understand new um fields that you want to enter into so it's a good way to kind of enter into that or you could also use 20 percent projects as a way to develop a new skill and so i would take on these 20 percent projects to also develop skills around analysis and develop skills around um you know like strategy and communication and so i would take those on I uh, did really well at those as well. And so within my first year, you know, with all of that, um, I also, you know, I also wanted to find some sort of way to be creative and on the side. And so what I did was I started creating videos for different diversity, equity and inclusion type based um, events and initiatives that were happening not within my my organization only, but also within the larger, um, the larger organization that sits above us. Mm -hmm. And so uh you know did all of that went really well for my first year um ended up getting promoted in my first year which is also pretty rare and so did all so that, like within that promotion i was also in the process of transitioning from you know a 20 percent project actually that was focusing on analysis of events and i moved over to a full-time role that would focus on us canada based events hmm. so when i entered into that um so yeah so got the promotion went into that role when I entered into that role, there was a there, it was a time when people across the globe were um, who were also in similar positions for their own regions were leaving because they've hit you know maybe three four years or so and they wanted to do something new, and so I stepped into that role and within maybe three four months or so I started um i started taking on more global work and so you saw that i was doing us canada 
um, based events and strategy and focusing on all that, just making our US Canada events significantly, um, you know, just better and uh, with a like, good quality, better analysis and ways that we can measure our events for the first time. And then started taking on these like global initiatives as well. And so uh, at a certain point, just doing those two things together just became increasingly difficult because I was, it was almost like two full-time roles. I was taking on a global role as well as this US Canada specific role. So it was hard to narrow in on my region and do it really, really well if I was also focusing at a global level. And as people were coming in, you know, like new people were entering those older, old positions, I started also ramping them up. So it was, I was incredibly stretched and I told my manager that I just needed some sort of way to break up these two roles and so what she did was she created a brand new role for me in that next year that was specific to global events and that was the first time that we had a global events lead role and so she created this role for me and i started having a little friction with different regions because i just didn't know how to best um, work within this role because it, it was a brand new role and i just didn't know like what would be my territory versus theirs right. and so uh and so that was uh that was a good way of you know like so i talked to my manager about it and she basically said your job is to make events better like point blank and so i don't know what it was in that statement but after she said that statement it was a really good way of me just feeling so much more free in terms of what i could do with this role and just structuring it as my own. And I can say, you know, a year now after after that conversation, it, I, like I have made events significantly better. I've made the quality better. I've made the, um, I've made our analysis for events and how we can measure impact um, at a revenue level uh, significantly better too. And, and so there's just all these things that I've been able to do with that freedom and, um, and, it, yeah, since she met, like, since she said that, it just, it was like this a click in my head that allowed me to just take the role as I had wished. Um, so that was more so on like the core role side. Uh, there's also other work that I've done on the, the Black Googler network and, um, and things like that too. Oh, that's, I mean, so you changed the game within the company, basically. I mean, you definitely <laughs> made an impact um, there and no wonder like you are where you are at. Because like you're, you, you seem you're a problem solver. You're a problem yeah. solver. Yeah, yeah. I love I love a good problem. I, it's almost like I get a little obsessed with it. To be honest, like it's like I get I get really obsessed with finding the solution, and I always have to figure something out. And I think that's also just something that I take with me, also just with different risks that I have. Like you know, I may fail, but at the end of the day, something is going to work out, and I just have to keep on working towards that. So. It's, um, you know, problems are, problems are just exciting. They're just a good way to just challenge yourself and, and continue to grow. Right, that's so true. So like, no, that's, and that's why, again, like I remember watching, was it called The Intern, the movie? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, was it, was it like that? Um, was it like when I was an intern? It, so like, was the it way like the movie? They, yeah, it, like, it's, I think it's more, <laughs> comedic there right. I mean maybe there are like some like bits and pieces that you can pull from that like in terms yeah. of the creativity and um you know some of the ways in which they make you think but for the most part it's not as like scrambling competitive or like things like that <laughs> yeah it made it seem like it was like it was like a super super competition and <laughs> I, I, I like the part where they had to help the pizza shop um like increase <laughs> yeah increase sales or they had to put themselves on google they didn't want to be on there i don't know it was something it was interesting <laughs> that's pretty much yeah. great that uh you know to see the, the the work that you put in to get to where you are at and um yeah it's, it's, it's amazing so like even like so i was I kind of just going back and uh looking at uh it was like one of the clips and stuff from the, the event that we did together mm -hmm. and just seeing the excitement from some of the googlers and stuff like was was pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the gentlemen on his laptop was like, "Oh, this is super awesome! Like having a great time." <laughs> oh, the, hand, the violinist is playing; he's killing it right yeah. now. Um, yeah. I guess what was the energy from like everybody? I guess after the event and stuff from from the the, the virtual black uh, yeah uh, party. Yeah, everyone was super excited about it. Uh, they really loved, 
you know, having this positive moment in a sea of, you know, bad moments of 2020 from the pandemic to the protests to, Mm. you know, like some of our favorite celebrities and people that were parts of our family in a way. So like Chadwick Boseman, for example, um, John Lewis, like all these like really amazing people who, you know, passed away also within this year. And so with all of that, you know, with all of that grief and all of the emotions, you know, of this year, I think it was just a really great moment of having this one holiday event that would bring some good positive vibes, some good energy, a good way to just get people, you know, starting about 2021 and um, kind of focusing more on rejuvenation and wellness of our of our Black Googlers. Um, but yeah. No, that's powerful. That's powerful. It was, it was such a great event. How many people ended up showing up to the full event? Yeah, so it's a little hard to fully understand. So we had 360 or so people in one room with DJ Kitty Cash. And then we had um, around around the same amount, like around like, I think it was like around uh, 400 or so for a DJ Niger Boy. And then um, people in the main room, I think was around, it was like four, 480 plus, something like that. So it's hard to understand like which ones are unique viewers or not. But um, for the most part, I can for sure say that there's probably more than 500 or so people who uh, tuned in. And then we had around like a thousand or so page visits as well. Um, so overall, I think it was a, it was a really good event. And it's just, that was just one example also of one of the types of events that we've held over the past year Mm -hmm. you know moving over to digital nature and such there was also other events that we've had somewhat similar uh where we had a dj come in and you know do different dj battles similar to versus for example um, as one idea and that was always a really great way of just getting people hyped up and then we've had um you know different wellness events and such so you know just to back up a little bit i'm a co-lead for the south bay black google network chapter and so I came in at a time when, as a lead at least, came in at a time when it was, I think, oh, it was it was right after uh, Ahmad Arbery uh, recently, like when, when he was murdered, that's when I jumped in. And I remember like the first thing that we wanted to do was send out a note to everyone about, you know, like what they may be feeling what just kind of validating the fact that this is the time for them to um to feel all their feelings to take off from work if they need to to um to really experience the grief and um just like feel that the world that they were living in Mm -hmm. is something that is shared by other black googlers and um and just validating them as well uh, you know, oftentimes when we get into work, it's always like, it always like feels like, you know, some people are just going back to their normal days after. So like, for even when Nipsey Hussle died, right? Like just things like that, like there's, um, you just go into work and people are just going about their days and you have this thing in your, in your mind about this person who was recently murdered or died or, or this shock of like the different protests or, or just things like that, that, um, that carry with you when other people are just going about their normal days. And so came, you know, started off with that uh, as a lead. And then we moved on to, you know, the summer of the protests where uh, around that time, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did was, um, so Google at a higher level, at an institutional level was focusing on raising funds for, uh, for these, really amazing black led nonprofit organizations. So I think the NAACP was in there, Equal Justice Initiatives, so the Brian Stevenson's organization was also in there as well. And so they are focusing more on the long-term systemic work. Mm-hmm. And so what we figured what we can do from a grassroots level is support the people that were actually on the ground in the movement who were being affected, um, you know, just by protesting and peacefully protesting and existing. Um, and so what we did was we create, we created a, um, a campaign, an internal campaign that would help with getting donations for these protesters and the people that were focusing on the movement on the ground. So it, it helped, you know, for, um, for different people who were 
being uh, like, like so like bailout funds, for example, it also helped with um, legal, uh, legal funds to help with these um, protesters as well. So we raised around like $375,000 or so just from that. It probably is a little bit more now, but just from that initiative, and we did it within maybe like a week and a half or so. Wow. We got funds accelerated, I think around 100,000 or so that was accelerated just through a DJ event. So it was also a good way of just getting music and um, positive vibes to also help in increasing um, the funds. And the cool thing about it too, was that during that moment, it wasn't just a black Googler led um, fundraising effort. It was all these allies that were also coming in and shipping in funds right. to help with these specific movement led organizations. Um, so I think that was just something pretty beautiful to see like that, that level of community where people could give funds and it wasn't just on the it wasn't like just wait on black Googlers to to help our own people. Right. Um, it wasn't like this echo chamber, which was pretty, pretty nice to see. But yeah. That's a, that is awesome. That's great that, that those amount of funds were raised and that everybody, like you said, like it was different organizations that came to come help and, 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 and put into the fund as well, too. So, and yeah, for, you know, and I, and I hope for more of that to happen as well, too, you know, yeah, the years go on. So, to kind of close it up, um, got two more questions for you. Yeah. The first question is, what can you, what was I was going to say, what, okay, what, what are some things that people can do to get to where you are? People that are listening right now, someone that's in high school that admires you, that's watching this, how, what do they need to do to get there? What are the steps they have to take? Yeah, it's hard, right? Because I feel like the, my journey was not linear whatsoever. And I had this vision for myself for so much of my childhood of becoming a doctor. And then sophomore year of college, that's when it just immediately changed. Mm -hmm. And so I think that one of the things that I lean into a lot more these days is that I should be putting myself around good people who are very much invested in my success. Mm -hmm. And so my managers, my leadership team currently are really invested in me doing well and uh, in me growing and, and continuing to be a leader in various different forms. And so I think the good thing about that is that I trust that they have, like if I may not see an opportunity, they will bring it forward to me and they'll continue to help me in growing throughout my career, especially at you know such a young age still. And so that's how I've kind of moved forward it's like just doing good work seeing the different opportunities that come from it and you know for the most part i haven't really been about like sharing what i do necessarily like i'm not a person who will just go for visibility just for visibility's sake like i will send out an email or i will send out a note highlighting something if it you know gets to another aim like if it gets to amplifying other people's stories or if it gets to getting people to be persuaded into doing something that I need or something like that. So visibility for visibility's sake is not something that I'm that I'm interested in, but a lot of the work that I do is done really well and I take pride in that. And so I think that is one big thing that has helped me in continuing to grow and get new opportunities and just move, move in that direction. Um, like I know that like I may not have the next step already lined out, but with the work that I'm doing, I know that I'm moving in a positive direction. So I, I would say that it's like not, you know, don't pressure yourself with having a plan all figured out. There's sometimes going to be, um, you know, different opportunities that pop up, but I would say just surround yourself with good people who are invested in, in you. Um, and then make sure that, you know, you are also invested in other good people yourself as well. So, sure. yeah. Solid mentors, solid people that can that want to help uh, bring you up. They always say, "What well, keep the five, the five like four people you keep around you. Eventually, you either like be like them, or be within the same space as them, or yeah, yeah. Su succeeding yeah. or failing." So yeah, I mean, there's also like there's like this term of like having an advocate. Also, yeah. you know, it's like yeah, so a mentor is someone who can definitely take you through different phases of your life and, and kind of guide you in that. But an advocate is someone who 
like really advocates for you to get from like one position to the next. Um, sometimes people also call it, you know, a sponsor. Like I, I would see it as similar things, but an advocate is someone who can help in in moving you into that next level, whatever it may be. And what I what I have for the most part are just really great advocates, people who have seen my work and are able to effectively communicate it to other people as I need. So yeah, that is awesome. And you, you talk about this, like. Not as interested in that so much with the visibility aspect you were talking about. Um, yeah. I, the idea came to my mind was, I don't know if you're on Clubhouse. Um, oh, yeah. That, but like definitely an opportunity to like dive into a lot, a lot more about maybe some of the things that you've gone through or like you're talking about some of the organizations you're supporting um, or the initiatives that, you know, you guys are doing on there. And there's tons of uh, millionaires, billionaires giving free game on what they do and just hide, you know, just in rooms, just yeah. uh, listening and which you would have to pay like 50K to talk to them or just even have a conversation. So yeah. it's interesting. So it might be a cool, this idea that came to mind, might be a cool platform to kind of say, you know, be outspoken to talk about what you want to talk about and have a lot of people come in support. Yeah, that is, that's a good, uh, I always, I'm just like so curious, like if people are interested in like, what I have to say. And for the most part, like, I mean, I know that a lot of like younger people are, uh, but I think it's a, I think it'd be a really cool opportunity actually to, to just try out. I am not on Clubhouse yet, but I see it like literally all the time being talked about by absolutely everyone. <laughs> and so maybe that's just another platform that I could just start tapping into. <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, you ever get on there and you know, I have a, it's a couple people that I already like invited me to a lot of different rooms to like talk in. I mean, yeah. You can do like a talk or something specifically for a specific organization or talk about a specific topic on um, 4K. Yeah. Especially what happened was it, it's been two days now with uh, oh my Capitol. Goodness. That is crazy. Yeah. There's a whole room about that. It was like two pe two thousand people in there talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. But uh, last question would be, what is a quote you can leave um, whoever's listening with, and a quote they can take home for the rest of their lives. Uh, that's a good question. So one of my favorite quotes is by James Baldwin. And I can't remember it, you know, exactly. But essentially the like what it's saying that like, the quote mentioned was uh, like the paradox of a good education is, you know, once you become educated, you become more critical of the society that you are educated within. And I thought that was such a beautiful quote and something that still sticks with me to this day because it's, um, you know, a lot of the things that I grew up with, you know, being of a lower socioeconomic status, being a feminist very much like when I was when I was younger, but just not really having, you know, the language to say it like all these things were um, like I felt, but I never but I never could really describe what my um what my experiences were because I just didn't have the language or the vocabulary for it. Once I got into college, I, um, it was a, you know, a radically different type of education. And then it was also better quality education than what I've experienced in the past. But the, like just learning more things like, you know, reading more books, having some really amazing, uh, black women professors, uh, having some really amazing white men professors, like all these like really amazing people have helped in shaping so much of what I learned today and, and my constant, um, my constant like, you know, wanting to continuously learn. And so I think that's a, it's a really powerful quote because I just think about, you know, the people who just may not have the vocabulary to explain like the situations that they're in, but these in some ways like, um, you know, like these people who've like gone to school who are privileged in some sort of way were able to learn a little bit more and, and kind of understand like the different situations that other people are in who, are don't, who don't necessarily have an education. So yeah, it's just a, it's a beautiful quote by, by James Baldwin who also happens to be one of my favorite scholars. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You know, yeah. everybody resonates and takes that home. That's a take home. You know, she's dropping gems. Yeah, she's dropping gems. <laughs> um, and I guess last thing, because you talked about books, um, two two of your favorite two books that we should be reading this year. Yeah. So the first two that popped into my head are 
uh, now there's three. Um, okay, so there's one that's, um, it was one that forever changed my way of thinking and I absolutely love it. It's called, uh, so it's by Anand, A-N-A-N-D. Um, I, I, I'm gonna butcher his last name so I won't say it, but uh, it's called the, um, I think it's like the elite charade of changing the world. I think it's winners takes all. Yeah, winner takes all the elite charade of changing the world. And basically it's a really good book about how these really powerful people and these really powerful companies will try and, um, you know, put guardrails around like what social justice actually means. So like one of the things that he really mentions there is that, you know, all these like really big, uh, you know, billionaires have, they're trying to take the lead in shaping what social justice movements almost look like, or like they'll they'll take on like racial justice, for example, and um, what they don't, or even like socioeconomic justice. And what they don't realize is that, or they may, but they just wanna have control over like what that narrative looks like. And so, you know, to really have justice, it means that at least for from a class perspective, you, these billionaires need to, you know, take some of their money and give it to other people. But by safe, like by putting guardrails around the narrative, it's not really allowing that um, justice actually take place. Right. So he's a really, really good author. Um, he also talks about, you know, how we don't really have many critics in today's society. We have a lot of thought leaders, but not many critics. Um, so people, you know, will take on like TED Talks and such, and they, um, they, there's not really an opportunity to engage in criticism or just ask questions. It's really just, you know, you'll go on stage, you'll talk about a certain topic, and then you're just out versus critics who have a much more um, engaged discussion between two people. And um, it's a little bit different from cancel culture, I'd say. Um, so really good book. That one's a really great one. The second one that I was thinking of is called, um, it's called, I think, The Broken Ladder. Um, and it's something, I forgot what the guy's name is, but it's something to do with like inequality as well. But it's really interesting because he talks a lot about how inequality is the root cause of a lot of different things. So like if you if you think about like poverty, for example, it's not necessarily, there are countries that are suffering from poverty for sure, but what's causing a lot more concern is just the inequality that comes from poverty. So like if you, um, or not that comes from poverty, but just inequality in general. So if you think about, you know, people who are of like lower income statuses, um, they will feel that they aren't making the same amount of money as like these like billionaires because like the inequality gap is just so significant. Right. Um, and so like, I mean, even, even if you think of just like people who are um, upper middle class, like they will also feel that they are not making sufficient amounts of money as again like these billionaires because the gap again is is there and it exists so it's just a really interesting way of thinking about you know like how people's minds work when it comes to inequality and you and you see the effects especially when it comes to stress when it comes to pregnancy levels when it comes to people who are very much more devoted into religion and such too so that one's a really good one and then i think the last one that i would say is probably education of an idealist by Samantha Power, who used to be the um, U.S. Uh, ambassador under President Obama. And she just has a really amazing story. I've, it's probably one of my favorite books of 2020. And it's it's very long, I will say that, but it's a really good book that just talks about her humanitarian efforts and her going around the world and the things that she's pressured and pushed uh, Barack Obama to do, um, even in things like naming a... Um, you know, naming something a genocide, like that that takes a lot of work. And so for for her to be explaining her story, I think was just absolutely beautiful. So those are three, I know it's more than two, but yeah. Well, no, no, it's, it's good. We need some books to read this year. Cause like, <laughs> it's like it's two, to, two to three books a month. Is my yeah. goal. And it's been like, yeah. I crush them out each month. And then if I can't, you know, you can get busy sometimes and you're like, dang, like I'm tired or you want to, uh, audio, audible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need to get into that. I feel like it'd actually be really cool just to hear it from the author, especially when it comes from the author themselves, you know? Right. Um, that is yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. So hearing like the generic person read it. Yeah. Hearing from that. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> well, um, I don't know if you want to like shout out your social medias or anything like that or where people could find you at if they want to connect with you if you want them to um, um, give you the floor to do that. 
Yeah, so uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's B as in boy, S-E-R-A-T-G, um, so that's right, G, and um, I don't know, I mean, like, for the most part, you know, I'm always on social media, so I'm just looking at the news and seeing what people um, have to say, the commentary, especially on Black Twitter, so feel free to just send a message or connect if you're, if you're ever interested, I'm happy to help. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, of course. You on, and <laughs> hopefully we can get you back on like in the end of season three or season four. But no, it's great having you on, and hopefully uh, check out Clubhouse. <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's 2021, 2021. 2021, yeah. right, right. Awesome stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Life Journey Podcast with Quentin Gauze. To find out more and to follow the journey, visit Quentin's Instagram at QGauz or our business page at iron underscore visuals. For full recaps of the show, find us on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>